Thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, the, uh, the, the title of the talk is somewhat pompous, and I was meant to get you through the door. Uh, as you'll see, there are more questions than answers in this talk, and I think that's what I hope to convey. Uh, also, if <clears throat> anything I say doesn't make sense, it's probably because uh, I was in India last week, in Princeton for a day, and now my body has no idea what time it is, so bear with me. Okay, so uh, there's a common paradigm for um, designing algorithms, especially approximation algorithms. Uh, it's called the relax and round paradigm. Um, and the way it works is the following. You want to solve some kind of optimization problem over some set, some discrete set, which is hard to describe exactly, hard to optimize over. Uh, we find some, some sort of convenient body that encloses these feasible points. And instead, we try to solve over this larger body, this relaxation. Okay. Typically, you could solve this easily. Um, an optimum solution on this larger space is called a fractional solution. Um, okay, but this is not what we wanted. We were actually wanted to solve the problem on the original uh, feasible, uh, on the original set of points. So somehow we take this fractional optimum and we map it to a solution the feasible set. Okay, so we first relax, solve on the relaxation, and then we round. Right? And this kind of paradigm is, is being used a lot to design um, algorithms, approximation algorithms in particular. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very popular. Okay. So the question I'm going to ask in this talk is, um, is it plausible or you know, when does it happen that you apply this relax and round paradigm, but you don't need the rounding step? Is it possible that you solve this relaxation? In fact, it solves the original problem that you start, started out with. Okay. Um, in fact, this happens in many interesting cases. Uh, you know, there are some problems for which you can solve all instances in this way. Uh, because basically all vertex solutions of this relaxation are integral. So you know we know many examples of this. Matching is one example. Um, you want to max given a graph. You want to maximize the number of edges divided by the num the size of the subset. This problem can be solved optimally using linear programming. And there are a bunch of others. Okay, so these are well studied, well known. Um, also really strong because we're saying that you know for all instances. This relaxation, in fact, captures the problem exactly. Okay, what I'm looking for is something a little more interesting, um, where you know this doesn't really happen for all instances, but it happens for instances with some structure, perhaps. Um, again, there are, there are examples of this known, uh, pointing to some work of people in the audience. Uh, a very nice recent paper of Makarichu, Makarichu, and Vijayarago, and showed that. There's a notion of stability for max cut. This was introduced by Bilu and Lineal in some uh, recent work. And what these guys showed is that if you have an instance of max cut that satisfies the stability property, uh, then the Gomans Williamson semi definite program for max cut is actually integral. Okay, so it's, you don't expect it to be integral for all instances, obviously. But if you have this property, then in fact it's integral. Um, and there are many other examples where uh, you study the problem under some kind of random distribution on input over instances, uh, and somehow it turns out that the relaxation is integral. Okay, and it's this last one that I'll, I'll talk about uh, much more, pretty much for the rest of this talk. In fact, the distinction between this one and this one is somewhat artificial because. Typically, the way in which you show that um, you know, if you have a random instance of a problem, you apply convex relaxation, you get an integer solution, you say, well, you list a bunch of properties, right? You say property one, property two, property three. These are properties that hold with high probability for random instances. And together, these probabilities imply that you have an integer solution. So you know, the fact that I've put these on different bullets is somewhat artificial. OK, so these are the kinds of questions we're going to ask. Um, you know, for various problems, when you have suitable random distribution of inputs, when do you have integer solutions? And why the focus on convex relaxations in particular? Well, 
one thing that's nice about these is that this is not tailored to any particular input distribution, right? Um, I mean, for many of the examples that I'll talk about, you can look at the distribution and say, well, for this, can't I design a special algorithm taking into account this distribution? And that's less interesting from my point of view. It's, it's nice to show that a more general tool will actually solve the problem. Okay? And in some cases, as you see, there's, I'll point out to cases where this, this kind of uh, robustness is actually useful. <clears throat> One nice thing about convex relaxations is that they come with a proof of optimality, right, as opposed to other heuristics. When you solve the problem and you get an integer solution, you have a guarantee that you, in fact, found the optimum solution. Okay? And that's a nice thing to have. Okay, so, um, you know, this is not a new thing. Uh, you know, there are many, many instances where people have encountered this phenomenon. And I'll point out to some that you're probably very familiar with. Um, there's some very nice work on LP decoding where you'd like to decode LDPC codes using linear programming. And uh, a bunch of work has shown that, you know, under certain conditions and so on, this linear program that they describe, which I'm not going to get into, actually solves this problem optimally. Um, of course, everyone has heard about uh, the, you know, the area of compressed sensing. It was set off by uh, a couple of papers that showed that uh, if you want to recover sparse signals you know, under certain conditions, if you solve a certain linear program, you will, in fact, solve this, solve this problem. A lot of, lot of work on this, and there are many more people in the audience who know this stuff better than I do. Um, Similar vein of work on uh, matrix completion. Uh, given a matrix, you know some of the entries, you'd like to fill in the blanks. This is a low-rank matrix. Um, perhaps there's noise. You know, there are many, various models. Can you solve a convex program to actually recover this? And in a very similar vein to the work on compressed sensing, we're using nuclear norm and so on, um, people have shown that, in fact, the solution to these convex relaxations will solve the original problem. Okay. All right, so uh, examples abound. Let me tell you some examples that you might not know about. In fact, I learned about this at a workshop uh, at Princeton a few years ago, and I was very intrigued. Uh, so th these are some examples from uh, David Sontag's thesis in 2010. He was looking at um, map inference and graf graphical models and really applying this to practical problems. So you know, I think the... the title of this workshop has practice, so this is my practice slides. Um, so he was applying this to uh, side chain prediction, protein design, stereo vision. Don't ask me exactly what these questions are, because I don't know. Um, but here's what he was doing. He was trying to solve these problems. So this is some kind of graphical model. He's trying to find the most likely configuration given some sort of energy function. Um, he looks at various LP relaxations of this marginal polytope. Okay, so the marginal polytope is exponential size. It looks at uh, relaxations of this. And basically, in practice, as well as for artificial instances, so for real instances as well as for artificial instances, um, he discovered, and this is joint work with several other people also, that LP relaxations actually return integer solutions signal and fraction of the time, okay? So he looked at a certain relaxation that he calls pairwise relaxation, and this was integral 88% of the time for this particular, this particular experiment. And then when he adds uh, additional inequality, strengthens the relaxation, he gets integer solutions 100% of the time, okay? Um, and this is not the only thing. There are other examples. For example, some follow-up work uh, in natural language processing. In this case, they're trying to do parsing and some kind of part of speech tagging. Again, they have the same phenomena. Empirically, they observe that the LP relaxation often leads to an exact solution. Okay. And this is intriguing. This is something that we'd like to explain. I should tell you at the outset, we're not going to explain this. But this is the motivation for studying these, these kinds of questions. In fact, well, my first brush with this was when uh, uh, my colleague Sanjeev was uh, chairing Fox and I wrote a little uh, script to assign papers to PC members under various constraints. So, you know, I solved a linear program. I expected to get a fractional solution that I would then round. 
But lo and behold, I actually got an integer solution. So anyway, all right. <clears throat> okay, so how do we explain this? Before I try to uh, tell you what we actually did, let me still go through the work of others because there are many people who have studied this phenomenon. Let me point out several other instances other than the ones that you might have seen that I pointed out before where people have studied convex relaxations and found that they get interior solutions. Okay? So here's a, a model for graph partitioning. Um, imagine I have my vertices divided into two groups. I don't tell you what these two groups are. Okay? Now, um, I am, I'm going to build a random graph, which is a function of these two groups in the following way. You know, inside groups, I place edges with probability p. And across groups, I place edges with probability q. I give you this random graph. And now your goal is to recover these groups. This, is, this model is called stochastic block models. And you know, in the literature, it's very well studied. Um, in the theory community, this was studied by Feige and Killian in 2001. And they showed that you know, the straightforward SDP relaxation for this is exact. So with high probability, if you write a SDP relaxation, and now I'm hiding various things. You know, what, there are, obviously, there are some conditions for P and Q. If P and Q are sufficiently far away, then the SDP relaxation is exact. Okay. And why is this useful? Now, OK, before they did this, uh, you know, there, was, there was other work that showed that there's a spectral algorithm by Bopanna that recovers this partition. The nice thing about having an SDP is that it's actually robust to adversarial changes. So not only can you take instances that are described like this, but you can also change the instance. What if, after the fact, an adversary deleted some of the edges going across, added some edges inside? Well, the SDP doesn't care. It will actually solve that optimally, too. Okay. So you get this for free. right? The nice thing about showing that a convex relaxation is integral is that you actually get the result for an even stronger model. And uh, you know, this notion of semi-random graph partitioning has been taken to new heights by work of Makarichi, Makarichi, Vijay Raghavan in a couple of papers. Uh, but that's the topic for another talk. Um, let me also mention another thing. Um, so you know, Feige and Killian were really interested in when do we get exact recovery. And they, they gave some condition, which was basically within constant factors, the right answer. Right? Now we actually know what the exact right answer is. We know the exact threshold where uh, exact recovery is possible. It yeah. says that you know, above the threshold, we can do this, in fact, via semi-definite programming. And below the threshold, it's not possible. Okay, so we really know this, this answer very well. Um, here's another problem, very similar. Uh, it's called correlation clustering. There's been a lot of work on this problem as well. I'm going to focus on this kind of planted model for correlation clustering. Again, you have two clusters. Um, there's this hidden clustering that I'm supposed to recover. What's the information that I have? Well, um, I have a graph that's given to me. Uh, the edges of this graph are labeled with plus or minus. Okay? The intent is that the plus edges are inside a cluster. The minus edges are across clusters. Okay. Now, some subset of edges are labeled in this way. And the goal is to recover the clustering. Okay. If I just gave you perfect information, right? Every label was correct, and this would be a trivial problem, so long as the graph is connected, right? Because all you know, look at all the connected components with the plus edges that would give you your clusters. Okay. Now, what if the data is corrupted, right? What if I flip the labels of edges with some probability? When can you recover exactly? Okay. Uh, and some recent work shows that. Uh, you know, if you have this model under some conditions, a semi-definite program actually recovers the solution exactly. Okay. Again, there are other ways you might solve this problem. But it's interesting that actually a semi-definite program actually gives you the right answer in a certain parameter range, which is more or less the right range. Okay. All right. So the thesis or the motivation for this talk is I want to try to push the idea that Looking at integrality of convex relaxations is an interesting phenomenon. 
we should understand this more than we do currently. Um, you know, in, in approximation algorithms, relaxation they use a lot. And the way in which we measure the strength of a relaxation is by how well this relaxation can be used to produce an approximation. Right? We measure the integrality gap. How far um, is a fractional solution from an integer optimum in terms of objective function value? What's the maximum ratio? Well, this is a different way to look at relaxations. Uh, it comes with its own pitfalls, of course, because uh, you know, we can't look at how likely is it for a relaxation to be integral without somehow specifying a distribution of inputs. And that's where uh, the question is, you know, what is a natural distribution, and so on and so forth. But regardless of that, it's an interesting question to ask to compare relaxations with this objective, somewhat different from the usual approximation objective. Um, and if you look at the instances that I talked about, you know, many of them have this flavor that you have some sort of ma data <coughs> matrix which has independent entries, okay, with some kind of distribution, right? So, for example, in the stochastic block model, there were two blocks, and there were ones with some probability inside the blocks, there were ones with a different probability in the cross blocks, and so on and so forth. It would be nice to also study or understand this phenomenon of integrality in the regime where um, you don't have independent entries, there's some sort of dependencies which are inherent in the distribution. Now, this sounds very vague, uh, but I'll try to, you'll see what I mean in, in a moment. Okay, so my goal is to try to give you a flavor of some of these questions and results. Uh, I'm not going to try to prove anything at all. In fact, I won't even state any theorems. Okay, so I just want to give you a flavor of, of some of these questions. I want to run through different kinds of problems and try to illustrate this, this phenomenon. Okay? All right. Questions? Okay. All right, so we'll look at clustering problems. That was one of the problems that we looked at. Um, given points in d dimensional space, the goal is to divide into k clusters. k is given to us. I know there was a question about, you know, how do we figure out k? I'm not going to answer that question. Um, I have a bunch of data. I have k. I want to divide into k clusters. Um, now, if you look at the distance matrix, for example, uh, you know, even if I pick random points in space, my distances are not independent, right? So there are some inherent dependencies in these distances. This is, th this is actually what makes... Uh, dealing with such such kinds of instances is difficult. Okay, uh, there has been some prior work on trying to understand when relaxations of clustering and objectives are integral. Uh, for example, this paper showed that you know they basically derived certain conditions. They said if these conditions hold, then the relaxation for k median is integral. And if you don't know what k median means, don't worry, I'll actually tell you in a second. All right, so this was a model uh, which was introduced by Nellor and Ward. Uh, and it seems like a real toy model, but even dealing with this model is not easy. Okay, so here's the model that they, that they uh, proposed or analyzed. They said, suppose I have n points drawn from each of k spheres. Okay, so I have k spheres. I draw n points from each of them randomly. Um, and I have some kind of minimum separation delta between spheres. How much separation do I need to guarantee integrality? Okay, so you look at your favorite clustering formulation. How much separation do you need to ensure that this is integral? Okay. That's the question. And they proved for, for delta bigger than, I forget, 3.45. Uh, 3.75 or something like that, they show that, in fact, this is integral for k-median. Again, I haven't told you what k-median is. I'll tell you in a second. It doesn't matter how, much, how many points, data points you have. You need sufficiently large number of data points, and I'm, I'm sort of shoving this under the carpet. Okay. So uh, you should think of it like this. Imagine you really have a very, you have the continuous distribution. Okay. It should work for that. And then, you need to sample enough so as to 
approximate this continuous distribution. Something like this. Okay, so the first uh, thing I'm going to talk about is some joint work in th that will appear in uh, the upcoming ITCS. Uh, so we looked at the same instance. Please, please. Delta is greater than three or four or something, just distance space. Everybody in your cluster will be closer to you than everybody in other clusters, right? Yeah. If it's bigger than three. Three. Uh, yes, yes. So is that towards the opposite? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so we're going to try to look for separations smaller than that. Okay. The other answer to your question is, remember I said, I don't want to tailor my heuristics to the specific distances. But what you're suggesting is fairly, you know, it's a reasonable way to, to cluster. You're saying just look at distances, threshold. Uh, if you're above a certain distance, you're definitely in different clusters. If you're below the distance, you're within the same cluster. Yeah, but we'll look at some regimes where that won't work. Okay? So, okay, so this seems like a... Ravi's reaction is probably something that you all experience, like, come on, this has got to be something that you can do. This is super easy, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you, you can come up with heuristics that will do this. But let me give you one piece of information to suggest that this is somewhat non-trivial. So, uh, look at your favorite k-means clustering algorithm. So, what is this k-means clustering algorithm? It uh, starts with some initial configuration, so it, in some way, and then it uh, it assigns every point to the closest closest cluster center. Um, it finds the best centers for each of the clusters and repeats this process. Okay, so this is an iterative algorithm for k-means. It's, it's actually Lloyd's heuristic, um, and the claim is that for this kind of distribution that I described. For any cluster separation that you want, Lloyd's heuristic, you can design instances where Lloyd's heuristic will fail with high probability. Fail in the sense that it will not recover the true cluster. You could say, well, is that a big deal? Maybe it'll give you something that's a solution value that's very close to the optimum. Yes, that is true. It will give you a solution value that's you know, 1 plus epsilon of optimum, but it will not recover the original cluster. Okay, and our focus was on exact recovery. So what does this sort of bad instance look like? Uh, basically, you have, so this is a very um, this sort of tailored to make this heuristic look bad. Uh, you have multiple copies of the following configuration. You have three clusters, A, B, and C. A and B are somewhat close to each other, and C is far away from them. Okay? And then you repeat this many times. Except, you know, the, the, these groups are all super far away from each other. So, you know, there's very little interaction between these guys. Okay, so, you know, the key to showing that these um, iterative heuristics fail is to show that your initial configuration is bad. And once your initial configuration is bad in a certain way, there's no hope. You do. Okay? So how do you do that? Well, I claim that, you know, for this kind of instance, if your initialization somehow assigned some group less than three centers, then forget about it. You're never going to get three centers in there, uh, and you you just you fail. Okay. Another way in which you could fail is okay. Every group gets three centers, but somehow two of them are sitting inside one of these guys. So it's they're not equally <coughs> distributed. Okay. And again, we have a problem. And the point is, if you certainly initialize randomly, it's very likely that something like this will happen. Even if you initialize in some clever way, there's a variant of k-means called k-means++, plus plus, which has a clever initialization. Even so, it's very likely. With high probability, there'll be some group that will be in a bad configuration, and that's it. Okay? So, it's all right. So even though this looks easy, at least... Uh, known heuristics will not recover this. Okay. All right. So let me talk about uh, the actual relaxations that we study. Okay. So I said abstractly we want to solve this clustering problem, and I said we'll look at convex relaxations. What are these convex relaxations? Okay. So there are two objectives we'll look at. The first one is k-median. K-median is the following objective. Um, 
you given a set of points, you're given you know, metric distances between points. You want to find k centers, k exemplars, if you will. These are points within the data set. You want to assign each point to the closest exemplar, closest center, and just measure the sum of distances of points to the centers, minimize the sum. Okay, that's the that's the objective. Okay, so um, let's write down a relaxation for k median. If you've seen this before, bear with me for a second while I explain what the relaxation is. So the relaxation is the following. Uh, my objective function is the following. I minimize sum of pairwise distances multiplied by these variables z, p, q. Okay, what does the variable z, p, q indicate? z, p, q, okay, so before trying to understand this relaxation, think of all my variables as either 0 or 1. If you understand this, if you understand this relaxation when all the variables are 0 or 1, then after you're done, you just say, well, now let's let them be fractional. That's the relaxation. Okay, so it's, for now, think of them as 0, 1 variables. So z, p, q is 1 if q is assigned to a center at p. Okay. So you, know, you see that this objective just measures the sum of distances of points to the centers. Okay. Uh, I'll have an additional variables y, p, where y, p is 1 if p is selected as a center. So now we need to put some constraints. The first constraint says that every point is assigned to one center, and that just says the sum of these ZPQ values is one. Um, the next one says there's a constraint between these ZPQ values and the YP values. Okay? If Q is assigned to P as a center, it better be the case that P was selected as a center. <coughs> so that's what this constraint is saying. And then you write the constraint that are exactly K centers. All the variables are non-negative. That's it. That's the relaxation. Uh, this is a very well-known relaxation. It's well studied in operations research literature, also in the theory, liter theory literature, and a bunch of approximation algorithms that build on this uh, relaxation. Okay. Any questions? All right. Another objective, k-means. Uh, again, you're given a set of points. Now, k-median, it didn't matter what space these points are in. Uh, for k-means, this is really points in Euclidean space. Uh, the goal is to partition into k clusters, minimize the sum of squared distances to the cluster centroids. Okay? That's the objective. Now, you probably haven't seen a relaxation for k-means. Uh, I'll show you a couple. But in, in writing down the, uh, these relaxations, it's helpful to rewrite the objective a little bit. Okay, instead of looking at the objective like this, let's equivalently write the objective like this. And I might be losing a factor of, I mean, there's a there's an exact translation between this and this one, maybe with a with a factor of two somewhere, but forget that. Instead of measuring the sum of square distances to the center, I do the following: for each cluster, measure the sum of square distances of all all pairs of points divide by the cluster size, sum over all the clusters. That's the objective. Okay? So same thing. It just it's a little easier to express this objective than this one. Okay? What's a centroid? Uh, just the average. Right? Uh, so in Euclidean space, you just sum up the points divided by the cluster size. <coughs> Other questions? <coughs> All right, so how do I write down this objective? Well, remember, this is the objective, right? Let's think of the objective as sum of square distances multiplied by some variables z, p, q, yeah. as we did in the k-median case. Now let's ask the question, what, what are these z, p, q values? What structure, what, you know, what, what properties are they satisfied? Well, in a real solution, in an integer solution, the ZPQ values have a block diagonal structure. Okay, so within a cluster, all of these values are one over the cluster size. Okay, so they're one over the cluster size for this guy, one over the cluster size for this guy, and you know the cluster size could be different. And there's zero uh, outside these blocks. 
that's what these ZPQ values are. Okay. So now I'm just going to write down linear constraints on what these ZPQ values should be. Okay. Okay, good. So in fact, the relaxation is almost exactly the same as our K-median relaxation. With one difference. The one difference is the following. Remember I had this ZPQ less than equal to YP. I said, you know, if I choose, if P is assigned, if Q is assigned to P as a center, then you better have opened a center at P. Now I have a symmetric constraint. I have ZPQ less than equal to YQ as well. So the way in which you should think of ZPQ now is <coughs> if ZPQ is positive, it means that P and Q are in the same cluster. And moreover, the intent is that they're in the same cluster of size 1 over ZPQ. That's what ZPQ is supposed to mean. And, if, and YP is supposed to mean that P is in a cluster of size 1 over YP. Okay, so relaxation is, yeah. So, uh, both these remind me of the Wasserstein matrix, right? The earth over distance, except for the less than or equal constraint. Um, well, will you show us the dual of these? Or I won't show you the duals of these. Uh, it's a different, possibly, because, um, uh, right, so you could think of CPQ as some kind of flow. I don't think it makes sense for this, for uh, the K-mean relaxation. It probably makes sense for the K-median. I mean, in some sense, what you're doing is, uh, could be interpreted as Wasserstein metric in some way. Yeah. So you get for free that ZPQ is all equal for P and Q in the same cluster? Don't you need that? No. Uh, that's the intended solution, right? An integer solution has to solve. So this is a relaxation already. This is a relaxation. Even without integer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, you, you do want that. You want the ZPQ is equal to, is the same within a cluster, but I have no way to express that. I don't know how to express that. Okay. Um, so we haven't seen this relaxation before. Um, you know, maybe maybe someone looked at it, but I, I'm not aware of it. It's a very simple relaxation. It looks just a little tweak on the K-median relaxation. Yes. Sorry, what you, couldn't you just make the, oh, I see. If you made the cluster centers variable, you get nonlinearity because it's multiplied by y p. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. That's why. So it was T. The fact that I rewrote the objective in this particular way is actually really important. Okay, any other questions? Okay. All right, so while we're about, why don't we write a semi-definite program? Um, it's much shorter, uh, but that's only because there's a compact notation. All right, so it's the same thing as before, okay? The key difference is the following. I have my ZPQ values, and I have the YP values, right? Think of the YP values as ZPP, the diagonal entries. And arrange, look at the Z matrix. Look at the intended Z solution. It, it looks like you, know, you have a bunch of these blocks, and they're one of a cluster size in each of these. This matrix is positive semi-definite. That's it. I add the positive semi-definiteness constraint. That's my SDB relaxation. Okay, so if you're really paying attention, you probably realize that I dropped some constraints. Um, I didn't have diagonal dominance. So, you know, I had diagonal dominance earlier. I had ZPQ less than equal to YP, ZPQ less than equal to YQ. I dropped the diagonal dominance constraint. You can add that in. It would be a stronger relaxation. Uh, our results actually apply to this one. Hold for this weaker one. Okay, that's why I didn't add them in. This relaxation is not so popular again. For some reason, people haven't studied it that much. We did find one reference in the literature to this. So there's at least one paper that proposed this relaxation and looked at it. OK, for k means. OK. All right, so here are the results. Um, we show that you know, for that particular distribution of inputs that I described before, um, this k-median LP is integral so long as the cluster separations are bigger than 2 plus epsilon. What are the units? What's 2? Uh, each cluster is of radius 1. Okay, so each cluster is of radius 1. 
And so long as your cluster separations are bigger than 2 plus epsilon, then the relaxation is I should say there's a, you know, there is several caveats, which is, um, for one thing, we need the fact that you sample a point that's very close to the cluster center. Okay, and in order to do this in high dimensions, it means that n, the number of points, is exponential in the dimension. Okay, so I'm sort of hiding these things under the carpet. Another interesting thing about our proof is that it pretty much gives you for free that uh, if you look at these instances and you run a well-known primary dual approximation algorithm by Jain and Vazirani for K-media, uh, for those of you who know about it, the way it works is that you you construct a certain solution. Uh, it might open too many clusters, and then you do some cleanup. You sort of merge clusters and so on and so forth. Um, in fact, in this case, under the you know for these conditions that we establish, uh, it gives you the exact solution. You don't need to do any cleanup. So, in fact, the Jain Vazirani approximation algorithm will give you an exact solution. Um, Okay, so the stories are different. Sorry, was there a question? The second line seems to contradict the first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the second line? It's K means. Yeah, unless that's so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. This is the cut and paste, and uh, <laughs> this should be K means, and this should be K means. Okay, at least someone's paying attention. <laughs> All right. So, um, if you look at the K means LP, then. It does quite poorly, actually, uh, from the point of view of integrality. Um, on the one hand, it, it is integral when the cluster separations are at least 2 plus root 2. But it's not integral if the cluster separations are less than this amount. So uh, I'll show you why, actually. And if you look at the k-means SDP, this is integral if delta is large enough, where large means is bigger than 2 plus this quantity. It's not an entirely satisfactory result, admittedly. It, it depends on the relationship between k and d. But if you're willing to give me the fact that d could be, let's say, much larger than k, then the SDP is integral for delta, which is larger than 2 plus epsilon, provided dimension is sufficiently large. So what was d? d is the ambient dimension. d is the dimension which all the points are. Okay. It's plausible one could do much better than this. For that SDP. Right, so those are the results. So if K is big, how come the LP looks better than SDP? That's because this result is probably not typed. I mean, we were really thinking about the situation where the dimension D is large, so this is the result that we got. We can probably go back and and fix things to uh, to get things to to look more commensurate with the K median LP. Sorry, the K means LP. Okay. Other questions? How much time do I have? Five Okay. Uh, all right, so how do we prove these things? Admittedly, this is the most uninteresting part, or at least the least insightful part of the talk. Um, but here's how you go about doing this. You, you look at the problem. It's a convex program, your LP or an SDP. You write it, look at the dual. First, you try to construct a dual solution that certifies uh, the optimum value, right? It says that you know, the primal is a minimization problem, dual is a maximization problem. You produce a dual solution that certifies that the optimum solution is no smaller than your intended optimum solution, okay? And now you have to, you have to look for somewhat stronger properties, and once you have these stronger properties, this says that actually the optimum solution is unique. The only one that's optimal is this intended solution. Okay. So, okay, so how do you go about doing this for any of the models, any of the input distributions that you'd like to do this for? You guess the values of this dual solution. Um, and then you, you, well, if you guess correctly, you try to figure out which ones, what conditions do you need for this dual to be valid. Um, this gives you some deterministic conditions that need to be satisfied. Right? And then you verify that the, these deterministic conditions are satisfied for your distribution. Okay. All right. So, you know, 
Let me not try to show you why, what's involved in showing these properties for k-median and k-median. Because as I said, you know, this is, in some sense, the least insightful part of the talk. So let me not say much about this. Let me say one thing, though. You know, if you're wondering why the k-means LP is bad, then here's what happens. For k-means, for the LP, if you have two clusters that are close to each other, and there happen to be a pair of points P and Q, such that their pairwise distance squared, actually, uh, is less than, look at the average distance of P to points in its cluster, the average distance of Q to points in its cluster. Okay. If these two guys are closer than these average distances, then there's an opportunity for this LP to cheat. The way it cheats is that it places some weight on this edge and subtracts a little bit from all of the other, all of these dashed edges. Okay, so the LP actually gives you a fractional solution. The SDP, on the other hand, cannot cheat in this way. So the SDP is actually more robust. In some sense, it needs at least half of, and this is very, very vague, it needs at least half of the clusters to share something in order for it to cheat. So it's, it's much more robust in this way. Okay, uh, let me not tell you about the k-median, sorry, the k-means SDP analysis. Um, let me tell you about a, another interesting phenomenon which we have no idea about, okay? And this relates to a certain thing called rank recovery. So, so in the abstract, here's the thing. Uh, we're switching gears now. We're not talking about clustering anymore. In the last what, two minutes, three minutes, I want to talk, talk about one more thing, okay? So... Let's say you have a problem where you know you have a distribution on inputs and there's some noise parameter. I'll give you a concrete example in a second, but some distribution on inputs with some noise parameter. And you could ask, you know, for what values of the noise parameter can you recover the optimum solution? So presumably if noise is really low, you can solve you, you can get the optimum solution. Prerequisite of course is that for noise equals zero, the problem is easy to solve. Let's say that's the case. Now what happens if you, beyond this regime? If your noise is slightly larger, then what happens is that your planted solution is no longer the optimum, okay? Yet, for many problems of interest, it turns out that convex relaxations still recover low rank solutions. So the convex relaxations still recover integer solutions. It just is not the planted solution that you had in mind. And then, if you go to the high noise regime, then at this point, you know, the converse selection is not in integral, and in some sense, you would expect that finding the optimum solution in this case is, is a hard problem, because we don't have techniques to show these kinds of things. Okay, so let me give you, so this, this middle regime we call rank recovery. There's something interesting happening here, right? Um, the optimum solution is no longer the planted solution that we were hoping to get. It's something else. Yet our convex relaxation finds it. We have no way in which, I don't know any way to prove that this actually happens. But it does seem to happen in not one, but at least three different problems. Let me tell you one problem. Okay, this is joint work with a bunch of people at Princeton at IDCS in 2014. Here's the problem. Um, it's called multi-reference alignment. Um, and the problem in a nutshell is this. I have a signal. Think of a signal as a vector. Okay, so I have a vector with values for the coordinates. Now, I apply a random rotation to the signal. What do I, what do I mean? I just moved all the coordinates over by two and I rotated. Okay? And now I add noise. So instead of the entries of this vector, I have some corrupted entries. Okay, so I have a signal, apply a random rotation, add noise. Now, I give you many independent copies of this process. Your goal is to recover the signal. <coughs> okay, how do you do it? Well, if you knew what the rotations were, you would just unrotate an average. Okay? But we don't know what the rotations are. Uh, well, you can write down a semi-definite program to solve this problem. That's what we did. And the semi-definite program has indicator vectors for every copy of the signal or for every possible rotation. Okay. In some sense, 
the dot product between v i for rotation i and v j r j is sort of the probability that we pick rotation r i for x i and r j for x j. Anyway, using this kind of SDP, you can write down some objective which looks like the maximum likelihood objective. You want to maximize the sum of dot products of unrotated signals. Okay. And this kind of SDP actually re exhibits this rank recovery phenomenon. So if your noise was zero, okay, and let's say our original signal had no symmetries, you can solve the problem exactly. Right? You can start with one reference signal, align everybody to it, and you're done. Well, for that matter, you don't have to do anything. You just output any of the signals, and you're done. In the low no noise regime, you would expect that you can actually recover the signal very well, and you do. In the medium noise regime, you have this rank recovery phenomenon that we don't quite understand. And this would be very interesting to try to prove, to try to explain why this actually happens. OK, so let me stop with some questions. Uh, can I ask a question about the? Sorry. What was the question? Uh, how important is the structure of the, you know, these rotations? It's sort of like one, I mean, I don't, it's not clear why rotations are, are special. It's not even clear that you are, that everything has to be a group in order to do this. So I'll tell you what the real problem is. I mean, the real problem that, um, you know, the applied mathematicians, Amit Singer and company are interested in is you have some kind of three-dimensional structure, three-dimensional molecule. Um, there's something called cryo-EM. These things are frozen at really low temperatures in random configurations that you have no control over. You take two-dimensional projections of these. These are things that you can observe, but these are very noisy. And from these two-dimensional projections, you'd like to recover the three-dimensional structure. So our problem arguably was a toy problem. I mean, there are some motivations for this particular problem itself. But yes, you can study this in much more general regimes as well. I mean, I, I chose this because it's easy to illustrate. Yeah. Okay. I should stop here. I'm way about time. But let me just display this slide and leave it there. Okay? All right. Thank you. Questions? So in the results, uh, was it just in some cases or typically in case that for which one? So in the proof you indicated that we had to do with uniqueness of the optimal solution. So you do need uniqueness of the optimal solution. Well, That's not entirely clear. I mean, it could be the case that uh, you know all vertex solutions are somehow all the optimum solutions, but it would I would imagine this would be very hard to prove. So it's almost a prerequisite that you should have a unique solution in order to sort of uh, to be able to prove that the uh, convex selection will recover an integer solution. And, uh, the second point is work of Devagrad Shah and some collaborators. I see. For which problem? Uh, it's for matching. The yeah, matching is for sure, but maybe pre-matching. So I see. Okay, I should get get the reference. I mean, in general, I. I try to do a mixture of sort of a survey talk and try to describe these results. And obviously, in, in the survey part, I missed out on a lot of references. So yeah, I'd be happy to chat about that. Great. So for the last, I want to reference from, yeah. Have you thought about the case when maybe I have eight different factors, uh -huh. uh, each got you know, related uh, that noise to it, uh -huh. is there a hope to recover them? Well, so. Uh, first of all, if these vectors are different, as in, you know, there uh, are some, some invariants that you can compute, uh, then it might be easier to do it. But if they're sort of indistinguishable under some set of invariants, I, I imagine it would be much more challenging. Anyway, given the fact that we had so much difficulty with just one signal, we haven't ventured into that territory yet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, no, just a comment, I think, for the second one, right? I mean, at least a nice viewpoint, this is one, yeah, at least in the isotropic case, the one that comes from Gordon's theorem on Gauss and Gaussian width and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Essentially trying to understand the tangent cones of the, the, of the true polytope and the semi-definite approximation. So that's also very computational. I see. You can compute what the space transitions. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, I have to say that for these problems, for example, for the clustering work, we haven't reached that level of understanding where we, you know, we have a good intuitive explanation for why these things are integral, but you're, you're right. I mean, something like, we can take inspiration from Because then you can actually compute what it first mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good